Book of Heaven, Volume 4, Part 2 September 20th, 1900 Signs of the Cross to Heal Her I continued to suffer. Even more, I felt more than ever a resentment in my interior, for I was being forbidden to die. So on coming, my adorable Jesus reproached me for my delay in obeying, while up to that moment he had seemed to tolerate me. In the meantime, I saw the confessor, and turning to him, he took his hand and said, When you come, sign her at the place of the pain, for I will make her obey. And he disappeared. As I remained alone, I felt the pain more intensely. Then the confessor came, and finding me in suffering, he too reproached me, for I was not obeying. And as I told him what I had seen, and what our Lord had said to the confessor, on hearing me, he signed the place where I was suffering. And in two minutes I was able to breathe and move, while before I could not do it without feeling atrocious spasms. It seems to me that obedience and those signs of the cross have bound my pain in such a way that I can no longer suffer. And here is how I have remained disillusioned in my designs. In fact, this lady obedience has taken so much power over me that she lets me do nothing of what I want, even in the very suffering she wants to lord and I have to remain entirely and completely under her empire. September 21st, 1900, The Power of Obedience Obedience must be everything for her. Who can tell my affliction in being deprived of my dearest friend suffering? I admired, yes, the prodigious empire of holy obedience, as well as the virtue which the Lord had communicated to the confessor, who by the obedience and by signing me, had freed me of a malady which I considered grave, and which was enough to undo my body. But in spite of this, I could not help feeling the pain of being deprived of a suffering so good which moved blessed Jesus to pity and compassion in such a way that I could make him come almost continuously. So when our Lord came, I lamented to him, saying, My beloved good, what have you done to me? You had me freed by the confessor, and so I have lost the hope of leaving the earth for now. Besides, why make so many stratagems, putting Father in the middle, when you could have freed me yourself? Ah, huh, maybe you did not want to disappoint me directly, did you? And he, Ah, huh, my daughter, how quickly you have forgotten that obedience was everything to me. I want obedience to be everything for you. Besides, I put Father in the middle, so that you would have regard for him, as for my very person. Having said this, he disappeared, leaving me all embittered. How many things can Lady Obedience come up with? One has to know her, and have to deal with her for a long time, not short to truly be able to tell who she is. Bravo! Bravo, Lady Obedience! The more one goes on, the more you make yourself known. As for myself, to tell the truth, 
I admire you, and I am even forced to love you. But I cannot help feeling huffy with you, especially when you come up with one of your great ideas for me. Therefore, I beg you, O oh dear obedience, to be more indulgent, more indulgent in letting me suffer. September 22nd, 1900. As many times as she disposes herself to make the sacrifice of death, so many times does Jesus give her the merit as if she were truly dying. As I was all oppressed and afflicted, upon coming, my adorable Jesus told me, My daughter, why do you remain all immersed in your affliction? And I, Ah, my beloved, how can I not be afflicted, since you do not want to take me with you yet, and you leave me on this earth still? And he, Ah, no, I do not want you to breathe this sad air, because everything I have placed inside and outside of you is all holy. So much so, that if something or someone draws near you who is not upright and holy, you feel bother, immediately detecting the opposite stench of what is not holy. Now, why would you want to shade what I have placed inside of you with this air of sadness? Know, however, that as many times as you dispose yourself to make the sacrifice of death, so many times do I give you the merit, as if you were truly dying. This must be of great consolation for you, more so since you conform to me more, as my life was a continuous dying. And I, O oh Lord, it does not seem to me that death is a sacrifice. On the contrary, it seems to me that life is sacrifice. And as I wanted to say more, he disappeared. September 29th, 1900. The victim souls are supports and props for Jesus. I went through several days of silence between me and Jesus, and with scarce suffering. At the most, it seems he wanted to continue tempting me, to make me exercise a little bit more patience. And here is how. On coming, he would say, My beloved, I long for you from heaven. In heaven, in heaven do I await you. And he would escape like a flash. Then coming back, he would repeat, Cease your ardent sighs now, for you make me languish continuously to the point of fainting. Other times, your ardent love, your yearnings, are refreshment for my saddened heart. But who can say them all? It seemed to me that he was feeling like composing verses, and sometimes he would express these verses by singing them. However, without giving me the time to say a word, he would escape immediately. Then this morning, as the confessor placed the intention of having me suffer the crucifixion, I saw the Queen Mama crying and almost contending with Jesus in order to spare the world so many scourges. But he showed himself reluctant, and only to content the Mama, he concurred in making me suffer. Then afterwards, as if he had placated himself a little, he said, My daughter, it is true that I want to chastise the world. I have the lashes in my hands with which to strike it. But it is also true that if both you and the confessor interest yourselves with praying me and with suffering, that is always a support. And you would come to place as many props in order to spare the world, 
at least in part. Otherwise, not finding any support or props, I will pour myself out free hand over the people. Having said this, he disappeared. September 30th, 1900, Jesus asks her to console his afflicted mama. This morning, my most sweet Jesus was not coming, and I had to exercise much patience in waiting for him. I even reached the point of trying to go out of my usual state, for I felt no more strength to continue it. He was not coming. Suffering seemed to have fled from me. I felt my senses within myself. There was nothing left but to add an effort to go out. But while I was doing this, blessed Jesus came, and forming a circle with his arms, he surrounded my head. At that touch, I no longer felt myself within myself and I saw our Lord very indignant with the world. As I wanted to placate him, he said to me, Do not want to occupy yourself with me for now, but I pray you to occupy yourself with my mamma. Console her, for she is very afflicted because of the heavier chastisements I am about to pour upon the earth. Who can say how afflicted I was left? October 2nd, 1900, State of Victim for Italy and for Corato. Fearing that my state was no longer the will of God, as blessed Jesus came, I said, How I fear that my state is no longer your will because I see that I lack the two main things that kept me bound, suffering and your presence. And he, My daughter, it is not that I no longer want to keep you in this state, but since I want to chastise the world, this is why I am not coming and I make you lack the suffering. And I, why remain in this state then? And he, your position of victim and your continuous waiting for me already break my arms. In fact, you do not see me, but I see you very well, and I count all your sighs, your pains, your desires for me, and your remaining all intent on me is always an act of reparation for many who do not bother about me nor desire me, but despise me and are all intent on earthly things, covered with mud amid the stench of vices. So being the complete opposite of theirs, your state always comes to break justice, so much so that keeping you in this state and beginning the bloody wars in Italy is almost impossible for me. And I... How, Lord, to remain in this state without suffering is almost impossible for me. I feel my strengths failing me, because the strength to remain in this state comes to me from the sufferings. So since these are lacking, one of these days, when you are not coming, I will try to go out. I am telling you this in advance, so you won't be disappointed. And he, ah yes, yes, you will go out of this state when I begin the slaughter in Italy. Then I will suspend it completely. While saying this, he showed the fiercest wars which are to happen, both among the secular and against the church. The blood inundated the towns just like a pouring rain, my poor heart writhed for the pain in seeing this, 
and remembering about my own town, I said, A Lord, in saying that you will suspend me completely, you make me understand that not even for poor Corato will you have compassion. Not even Corato will you spare? And he, if sins reach a certain number, such that they will not deserve to have victim souls, and those who keep you as victim do not interest themselves, I will have no regard for her, and that is for Corato. Having said this, he disappeared, and I remained all oppressed and afflicted. October 4th, 1900. Jesus suffers in chastising men because they are his images. After going through a day of privation, and with scarce suffering, I felt convinced that the Lord no longer wanted to keep me in this state. However, obedience does not want to yield to me, not even in this, and she wants me to continue to stay, should I even croak and snuff out. May the Lord be always blessed and may his holy and lovable will be done in everything. Then this morning, on coming, blessed Jesus made himself seen in a pitiful state. He seemed to be suffering in his members, and his body was being torn into so many pieces that it was impossible to count them. With plaintive voice, he was saying, my daughter, what I feel, what I feel. These are unspeakable pains and incomprehensible to the human nature. It is the flesh of my children that is being lacerated. And the pain I feel is such that I feel my own flesh being lacerated. And while saying this, he moaned and grieved. I felt moved in seeing him in this state, and I did as much as I could to compassionate him and pray him to share his pains with me. He contented me in part, and I could only say to him, Oh, Lord, did I not tell you? Do not lay hand to chastisements. For what grieves me the most is that you yourself will be struck in your own members. How oh, this time there has been no way, nor prayers, to placate you. But Jesus did not pay attention to my words. He seemed to have something serious in his heart, which pulled him somewhere else. And in one instant he transported me outside of myself, taking me to the places where bloody slaughters were happening. Oh, how many sorrowful scenes could be seen in the world! How much human flesh, tormented, torn to pieces, trampled upon as one tramples the earth, and left unburied! How many tragedies! How many miseries! And what's more, more terrible ones are to happen. Then the blessed Lord looked, and all moved, began to cry bitterly. Unable to refrain, I cried with him over the sad condition of the world, so much so that my tears mixed with those of Jesus. After crying for quite a while, I admired another trait of the goodness of our Lord. In order to make me stop crying, he turned his face away from me. He dried his tears hiddenly. And then turning back again, with a cheerful face said to me, My beloved, do not cry. Enough, enough. What you see serves to 
justificare justitiam meam, meaning justify my justice. And I, a oh lord, then I am right to say that my state is no longer your will? Why my state of victim, if it is not given me to spare your so very dear members, and to exempt the world from so many chastisements? And he, it is not as you say, I too was victim, but even though I was victim, it was not given to me to spare the world all the chastisements. I opened heaven for it. I released it from sin, yes. I carried its pains upon myself. But it is justice that man receive upon himself part of those chastisements which he himself draws upon himself by sinning. And if it were not for the victims, he would deserve not only the mere chastisement, that is, the destruction of his body, but also the loss of his soul. So here is the necessity of the victims. Whoever wants to avail himself of them, because man is always free in his will, can find the remission of the penalty and the port of his salvation. And I, a oh Lord, how I would like to come to heaven before these chastisements advance more. And he, if the world reaches such wickedness as to deserve no victim, surely I will take you. On hearing this, I said, Lord, do not permit that I remain here, present at such sorrowful scenes. And Jesus, almost reproaching me, added, Instead of praying me to spare, you say you want to come. If I were to take all my own with me from the poor world, what would happen? Indeed, I would have nothing to do with it anymore and I would no longer have any regard. After this I prayed for various people. He disappeared from me, and I returned inside myself. October 10th, 1900. These writings manifest in clear notes how Jesus loves souls. The soul can only go out of the body either by force of pain or by force of love. While writing, I was thinking to myself, who knows how much nonsense in these writings? They deserve to be thrown into the fire. If obedience conceded it to me, I would do it, because I feel as though a hindrance in my soul, especially if they were to reach the sight of some people. At certain points they show as if I loved and did something for God, while I do nothing and do not love him, and I am the coldest soul that can be found in the world. And here is how they would consider me different from what I am, and this is a pain for me. But since it is obedience that wants me to write, and this is one of the greatest sacrifices for me. I commend myself completely to her, with the sure hope that she will make my excuses and will justify my cause before God and before men. But as I am saying this, blessed Jesus has moved in my interior and is reproaching me. He wants me to take back what I said and does not want me to continue writing if I do not do so. He is telling me that by saying this I have moved away from the truth, while the most essential thing for a soul is never to go out of the circle of truth. What is this? You do not love me? With what courage are you saying it? Do you not want to suffer for me? And I, all blushing, 
Yes, Lord. And he, well, then how can you think of going out of the truth? Having said this, he withdrew in my interior without letting himself be heard any more. And I was left as if I had received a heavy blow. How many devices Lady Obedience comes up with? If it wasn't for her, I would not find myself in these vicissitudes with my beloved Jesus. How much patience it takes with this blessed obedience. Now I resume what I was going to say, since the Lord distracted me a little bit from what I started. So on coming, blessed Jesus answered my thought by saying to me, Surely these writings deserve to be burned up, but do you want to know in what fire? In the fire of my love, because there is not one page that does not manifest in clear notes how I love souls, both in the things which regard you and in those which regard the world. And in these writings of yours, my love finds an outlet for my worried and loving languors. After this, he transported me outside of myself, and finding myself alone without the body, I said, My beloved and only good, what a chastisement it is for me, having to return so many times into my body, because surely now I do not have it. It is only my soul that is together with you. But then, I don't know how, I find myself imprisoned in my miserable body, as though inside a tenebrous prison. And there, I lose that freedom which is given to me when I go out. Is this not a chastisement for me? The hardest that can be given? And Jesus, my daughter, what you say is not a chastisement, nor does this happen to you because of your fault. Rather, you must know that for two reasons alone can the soul go out of the body. By force of pain, which happens at natural death, or by the force of the reciprocal love between me and the soul. In fact, when this love is so strong that neither could the soul last, nor could I endure for too long without enjoying her, I keep drawing her to myself, and then I put her in her natural state again. And the soul, drawn more than by an electric wire, comes and goes as I please. And here is how what you think is a chastisement, his finest love. And I, a oh Lord, if my love was big enough and strong, I believe I would have the strength to remain before you and would not be subject to returning into my body. But since it is very weak, this is why I am subject to these circumstances. And he, on the contrary, I tell you that this is greater love extracted from the love of sacrifice, that for love of me, and for love of your brothers, you deprive yourself and return to the miseries of life. After this, blessed Jesus carried me to a city in which the sins committed were so many that something like a fog was coming out, so very thick and stinking, rising toward heaven. And another thick fog was coming down from heaven, with so many chastisements condensed within it, as to seem to be enough to exterminate this city. So I said, Lord, where are we? What places are these? And he, This is Rome, where the evils committed are so many, not only by secular, but also by religious that they deserve this fog to finish blinding them, deserving their own extermination. 
In one instant, I saw the disaster that was happening, and it seemed that the Vatican received part of the blows. Not even priests were spared. All consternated, I said, My Lord, spare your beloved city, so many ministers of yours, the Pope. Oh, how gladly I offer you myself to suffer their torments, as long as you spare them. And Jesus moved, told me, Come with me, and I will show you to what extent the human malice reaches. He transported me into a palace, and inside a secret room there were five or six deputies who were saying among themselves, Only then will we surrender when we have destroyed all Christians. And it seemed that they wanted to force the king to write, of his own hand, the decree of death against Christians, as well as the promise to take possession of their goods, saying, As long as he consents to this, it does not matter if we don't do it for now, for we will do it at the right time and circumstance. After this, he transported me somewhere else and showed me how one of those who are said to be leaders was going to die. And this one seemed so united with the devil that not even at that point would he detach himself from him. All of his strength he drew from the demons, which courted him like a faithful friend of theirs. On seeing me, the demons were shaken, and some wanted to beat me. Some wanted to do one thing to me, some another. I, however, paying no attention to their bothers, because the salvation of that soul cost me more, tried hard, and I reached close to that man. Oh God, what a frightening sight, more than the demons themselves. In what a heart-rending state he was lying. He aroused more than pity. He was not at all moved by our presence. On the contrary, he seemed to make fun of it. Jesus immediately pulled me away from that place, and I began to plead before him for the salvation of that soul. You have reached the end of the Book of Heaven, Volume 4, Part 2. Fiat.